Guten Tag und herzlich willkommen. My name is David Gill. I'm the Consul General of Germany here in New York, and I would like to welcome you all to the second event that the consulate, together with ACG and 1014 Space for Ideas, are hosting to reflect on the German reunification, to reflect on the process itself as well as what it means for us today, how it, how it affects Germany, its economy, politics, international role, and so much more. Yes, it is very obvious that the division of our country, which happily ended with reunification 30 years ago, shapes Germany to this day. And it shapes the lives not only of those generations who experienced the Cold War, but also those who came later. On the day after reunification on October 4th, 1990, yesterday, 30 years ago, the Deutsche Bundestag was constituted for the first time as a joint German parliament. Our guest today were toddlers, I guess, not really realizing what was going on in the world. Today, they are members of the Bundestag, members of important committees, in one case, even the head of one. They debate, fight, and convince, develop policies, and shape their parties, and most importantly, serve their constituencies. And even though they won't remember the unification and East Germany even less so, they have to deal with the burden of the divided history of our country and the load many people have had to carry in the process of reunification. But at the same time, they enjoy the great benefits and chances this development meant and means for Germany. 30 years later, reunification affects our daily life and in the East probably more than in the West. But even there, I'm really looking forward to hearing from the perspective of the generation which grew up in a united Germany with all its challenges and opportunities. Thank you for all. Thank you to all of you for being with us this morning. And I hand over now to Steve Zocco. Thank you, David Gill. The American Council on Germany is delighted to partner with you and your colleagues at the German consulate here in New York, as well as 1014, to host this conversation with two young Bundestag members. This event is part of a series of virtual transatlantic town halls, German Bundestag member dialogues, which is being organized by the American Council on Germany under the auspices of Wunderbar Together USA 2020, a comprehensive and collaborative initiative funded by the German Federal Foreign Office and managed by the Goethe Institute. After a weekend of events celebrating the 30th anniversary of German unification, and a plethora of opinion pieces in the German and international press marking the occasion, we thought it would be interesting to speak with some young Bundestag members about how they view Germany today, since they have grown up in a united Germany. Joining me are ACG Young Leader alumna Gita Jensen from the Free Democratic Party, or FDP, and Elisabeth Kaiser from the Social Democratic Party, or SPD. Welcome to you both. Born in August of 1989, Gita was 14 months old when German unification took place. After 10 years of engagement in local politics, she became a member of the Bundestag in 2018, representing Schleswig-Holstein in the Northwest of Germany. She assumed the chairmanship of the Bundestag Committee on Human Rights and Humanitarian Aid making her the youngest committee chairwoman in the history of the Bundestag. Elisabeth Kaiser was three and a half when German unification took place. She's from the street, free, she is from the free state of Thuringia in Eastern Germany and has served in the Bundestag since 2017. She is a member of the Committee for Home Affairs and the Committee for Construction, Housing, Urban Development and Communities. In addition to her committee assignments, 
She has been a member of the German delegation to the Franco-German Parliamentary Assembly since 2019. As young representatives from the West and the East, respectively, who grew up in a Germany as it was growing together, I'd like to begin by asking you both the following question. What does German unification mean to you? And how important is the milestone of 30 years? Gita, let's start with you. Thank you very much also for the invitation, Stephen. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this discussion and also from, uh, to the questions uh, from the audience. Um, you just said that um, I was one and a half almost um, when Germany um, was reunited. So I basically know, I only know a reunited Germany. Um, I don't know anything else. And uh, still, I think it's important to, um, to see how Germany so far has been developing. And I still remember when I went um, on vacation with my parents to Austria we still had to show our passports at, um, at, um, when, when we had to pass uh, into Austria. So these things, I think, um, were normal um, also when Germany was um, not united, when it was divided. But still in the, uh, in the years following reunification, uh, I think um, it was still a very common thing that you had to do. You had to show your passports. Um, you said I, I've been growing up in Schleswig-Holstein, so basically a very northern but also western um, part of Germany. So um, for my family, it was not so much um, a question of, uh, of difference when you compare eastern and western Germany. I think um, in the north um, of Germany, it's all people don't care where you, you come from. We are used to uh, Danish citizens crossing German Danish borders all the time, and we also are used to immigrants um, from the Second World War. Not me and myself, but um, my family always um, was very well used to that. So um, when Germany reunited, and I talked to my parents about that, um, they said it was a kind of a feeling like a miracle, and still it was a um, a real revolution where people just wanted to be free. Um, I think Elisabeth has um, maybe even better stories from her parents than I could provide you with. But um, for today, I think um, our generation, it, for, for us, I think it doesn't matter so much whether you come from east or west parts of Germany, but rather where have you been growing up, which city, um, have you been going to school at um, which, I don't know, soccer clubs are you cheering for? These things matter more than being from the East or the West, just in my opinion. But um, I'm happy to hear different opinions about that. Thank you, Gita. I think that's a, a great way to start. And, and Elizabeth, I'd like to ask you the same question. Um, what does German unification mean for you? particularly coming um, from Thuringen, from Thuringia, in the eastern part of Germany. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very happy to join this conversation today. And yeah, to your question. Um, for me, I mean, I was very little. And in the 90s, I, uh, when I grew up, I grew up in a like, new construction building from the GDR, like typical GDR buildings. And so... Uh, for me, I was very used to it, and but other people um, telling me when I um, go to places like Bavaria and for vacation or something else, wow, you live there, and is it not, is it not um, I don't know, um, a bit of a strange, like in a ghetto or something else? So no, it's, I'm just used to it, and there are a lot of playgrounds and square green, and um, we have a nice flat there, so. I was used to, to grow up there, but there are so much stereotypes about these areas in cities, and yeah, they're still um, they're still there. And what I remember is in the '90s that we make a lot of holidays in Bavaria, and uh, first trips uh, they were to Hof. This is this is in the north of Bavaria, not far away from us. But for us, it feels like because my parents um, said we are we're going to the west. 
they still saying this and for me it was like another world and also there was much more advertising on the buildings at this time and the shops looks different because it's in where i lived it was just under an in change um things becoming another way um but this was still like a little bit gdr style and their reconstruction at um at this times and a lot of new buildings um were installed or um nice houses were built up and we where a lot of money uh, was going from the west to the east to yeah to build up the cities again and this was this time uh, yeah for me i just recognized we make a lot of discovering in the rest and also in the south of Bavaria where I spent my uh, holidays there were a lot of nice people asking a lot of questions about the east and how to live there and this was the time I recognized something special to be from the east um, of Germany and also when I studied I made, uh, did um, an Erasmus um, study abroad in Lille in France um, and there uh there was a big surprise because i have my uh, gdr birth um, certificates with me and it's wow this country or the state doesn't exist anymore i still have this birth certificate and that's something i always um noticed that something special to be out of a part of germany with, uh, which has been a different state once and yeah so this makes these are some impressions uh, where i recognize the east west um, discussion and also the feeling because for me growing up in you know unified Germany it was like normal I watched all the uh, tv shows from the US and it was quite typical in the 90s and um, I knew I can travel with my parents to other European countries on um, for me it was normal that was great um, I really enjoyed it and I could also study abroad my parents never had the chance to do that and um, when I grew up and get older, I just recognized that more, much more than when I was young. And today, I think I'm the first, gen one of the first genera generations who really, um, or which really um, um, pr uh, profits from all the um, things that reunification brought with, um, uh, bring with it. And because there are some generations who suffer from the breakdown of the economy after this time, uh, um, after the uni unification in the GDR. And they have like broken biographies and a lot of unemployment times. But for me, it was just like, I really had all the chances to grow up in the free world and uh, with all the possibilities um, that give me. So for me, it's a success story, but I see still the, um, outcomes of the unification and the first troubling years for some people in my constituency especially but maybe we can talk about that later on we'll, we'll certainly get into that and i think both of you have have raised some really interesting points about identity which i think we'll get into but also elizabeth your your comment of coming from some place that does not exist anymore um, I think for many people who are older than you, that's a, that's a hard um, piece of the narrative to try to understand. I've outlined some of these that exist today and have existed throughout your lifetime this, um, prior to 1990. And I'd like to, to dig into some of those a little bit later as well. But first, um, Elizabeth, I'd, I'd like to ask you a, a follow-up question because um, over the weekend, the former SPD politician Wolfgang Thierse wrote that German unity is not complete. And I'm asking you this because you're part of the same party as Wolfgang Thierse. And to provide context for our viewers, Wolfgang Thierse led the SDP, SPD in East Germany in 1990 before becoming the deputy leader of the party from 1990 to 2005. And he even served as president of the Bundestag and is currently a board member um, of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Um, and so it would be interesting for me to hear each of your responses, but, but yours first, Elisabeth, about this notion of German unity not being complete. Mm -hmm. 
I think this is a really interesting question. When we talk about um, the unification is completed, because do we have like a description when it's completed? Do we know, uh, do we have like criteria or something else? I don't think we have this and we still have differences or we always had differences be between the regions. I mean, I know that the North is completely different from the, the South of Germany and also the the new Bundesländer, the, the, the Eastern part of, the former Eastern part of Germany, the, this um, Bundesländer are not the same at all. So, but what he wants to say, I think Wolfgang Thiers is right when we talk about like um, uh, different structures and uh, economic development, because we have, I, I said this already, we had a big breakdown of the economy in the Eastern part of Germany the industrial development basis um, is gone, had, had been gone. And so it was really difficult to build up a new economy without any industry. So what we have now is a lot of uh, like little and little um, big si uh, size uh, companies. They are quite innovative and uh, doing well most of the time, <laughs> but uh, they don't provide a lot of um, employment in the region. And what is really special about Eastern Germany is that in the 90s and even before, there was a um, big um, development going on that people lift, leave the country, especially young people. And over this long period, um, the, and also more male um, men or male uh, population was left behind, I would say, so most young women left the country. And this incidence is quite um, original. It's, um, there's no other historical point or region in the world in this size where people left the country, like the demographic change is like really, um, yeah, special. And this is make something with our productivity and also with our society, because when you have more older people and more male people, like the a positive view of some things or like the, the activism to engage um, is not that big, it's not so much. So it's difficult to, to build up on something and we still struggle um, of this effect. Um, nowadays, today, we see that changing, people come back or people come to East Germany and live there, work there, but still difficult because when you have such a gap between people going and coming now, um, you have still a older um, generation. And yeah, this is some things um, that follows out of the unification process. And we have to look now what we can do to improve our economy, to use maybe the technological uh, revolution we see now to build up new kind of economy, especially in the eastern part of Germany, because we have a lot of space for plants or something else, but also for um, innovative um, areas. And then we have another structural change with our um, also coal industry going on and the state is um, uh, supporting it very much, uh, big financial um, uh, uh, how say um, uh, support is going on, and I hope this is, there's a chance to rebuild our economy much more. And another point where we're not equal, like the western part of Germany, are the um, the wages. They are still under the wages in average uh, of the western part of Germany, and but this is a, a thing that has to do with the less. Um, um, uh, tariff, is this tariff in English? I don't know. Um, like, uh, I just, I have to look what, it up. What, what's I, the German <laughs> word that you're thinking? Yeah, Tarife. Tarife. Um, as in the, the wages or the... Um, the uh, pay scale um, is different. Yeah, the wage structure. Yeah, and... Yeah, and the um, yeah, it's so there. We have to to um, yeah to improve a lot, and yeah, but this is a kind of ongoing discussion, and it's um, even worse that we see now that uh, the two thousand years of the two thousands in the beginning, 
the uh, wages were um, rising and now they are dropping again. So this is a quite difficult um, thing we have to struggle with. So, but this is there's the, the main inequalities. This is like the structural side, but then we have on the mind side, and this is, I think, much more difficult because it's necessary to listen to each uh, to to each other, to understand uh, much more the perspectives of one and each other, because I sometimes I think also East. German people, they make it a little bit easy and say, oh, it's all going down here and we have less chances than in the West. And they don't see that in the um, in North Rhine-Westphalia, there are areas there, there where the industrial or the coal industry breaks down and they also had to rebuild economy and they still struggle and they have a high, much higher unemployment than in regions in the eastern part of Germany. So... I think it's important to see that and to see what they have, what they gained and could be proud of. And this is still missing sometimes, especially in regions where you can't see so much progress. So I think it's important to change the perspective, to see what you have um, yeah, succeeded or what you have gained. And sometimes maybe to get another view of the whole thing. And, but this is a still ongoing process. Structural change is important in, in any country, and particularly if you look at, at, at Germany as a whole, there are regions that are managing structural change well, and others that are, are managing it less well. I, a north-south divide um, in Germany rather than an east-west divide between sort of a more agricultural north and a more industrial south. And, and so, Gita, I'd like to, to come to you representing the northern part of Germany, where there are also structurally weak areas. Um, not so much to talk about Schleswig-Holstein in comparison with, with Eastern Germany, but from your vantage point, do you think that German unification is, is complete? And if not, where are the areas where more work needs to be done? I think um, Elisabeth pointed out certain certain things and facts that I could um, underline uh, perfectly. I'd like to add some things um, to the list that uh, that you, Elisabeth, just noted because I think from your point of view, it makes perfectly sense that um, what you described as um, being not as engaged as maybe uh, Western Germans um, have been also during the time after World War II where civic society could or was able to be built up in a, in a more active way than in, um, in the GDR. And, um, but when you or when we talk to students who are applying for, um, for um, a place to study at a university, I think, um, and that's a personal, personal perspective maybe, that people tend to go to the eastern part of Germany, to Dresden, Leipzig, all these um, interesting cities, because the student life there um, has been developing a lot faster in comparison to other western cities. And I think when it comes to innovation and startup building, for example, um, the west should be um, sh or shouldn't be so... Um, up-nosed or up nosy when it comes to the potential that lies in the East, because um, I think there is a reason why Elon Musk um, is going to Brandenburg uh, to build his Tesla factory, his Giga factory, and not so much staying in, in or trying to get this uh, project done in Western parts of Germany. And um, Stephen, you, you mentioned Wolfgang Thierse. I, I'm, I'd like to add a, a statement of uh, Christian Lindner when, um, when he uh, a held a speech um, in, uh, from, uh, on, on Friday when we had a debate, a joint debate um, with regard to 30 years unity in Germany. And he said, well, there has to be a reason why Elon Musk goes to Brandenburg. Um, and I think that is, or he thought it also, it was also because um, uh, Eastern uh, German or Eastern Germans are more pragmatic when it comes to um, building new things and Western Germans maybe uh, uh, just 
trying to turn everything around and do their own thing with it. So um, from that point of view, I think we could rather learn something or we, the Western part of Germany could learn a lot of, um, from, from the Eastern German thinking when it comes to building something new. And I, um, I looked up some, some uh, facts and figures I think is uh, what are um, maybe a part of the answer to your question, Stephen, whether reunification has, um, has been successful and uh, completed. Um, most of Germany believes that reunification was a success. That is nine out of 10 um, people who have, have been asked. Um, and still grievances in the East run higher than in the West. And I think that goes hand in hand with um, sometimes not, or that um, people from um, the former GDR do not, and I think not so much our generation, Elizabeth, but rather our parents' generation, um, they do not feel appreciated so much. And I think that is something we need to change. Um, and after that has been changed, I think we could also call uh, reunification a success and um, basically completed. I think um, this kind of, well, it is a process that has never or that should never stop because when it stops, I think people or students would stop to learn about it in school because it is not worth dealing with. And I think that shouldn't happen. And when I think back to my um, school days, I would have wished that we would have discussed the GDR and the whole political system and the changes that came with it a little further than we have. World War II is in every curriculum you can think of in Germany. However, GDR and the focus on that um, could, be, could be focused more on, I think. Um, and when that happens, people and also our generation and the generation of our kids um, are really appreciative when it comes to having a united Germany because we don't know anything else. And still, I think um, also colleagues of ours um, from different parts of Germany um, should learn to talk more with each other about these things, how they, how they, see, how they see things um, also with regard to German perspectives that are very different sometimes when it comes to um, being from a north or northern part of Germany where uh, we don't have these big companies as uh, in Bavaria or uh, Baden-Württemberg, for example, and being very dependent on tourism, which is um, difficult at the moment in uh, COVID times. And people spend their vacations, for example, in Germany um, uh, in, in Schleswig-Holstein rather than going, I don't know, to Mallorca or somewhere else. Um, and all these um, closing downs of hotels in the COVID times before these vacation times, um, I think there, um, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern and Schleswig-Holstein, the, both of the um, eastern and western northern parts of Germany, have experienced very similar things and could relate to each other more than Schleswig-Holstein and Bavaria can. So, um, and another thing, and then I stop, um, I think where we could also learn from not a GDR pers perspective, but from the um, Eastern part perspective of Germany is that women um, went to work very early after uh, giving birth and having little children in uh, childcare very early. In Western Germany, that was a thing, and um, where that that was the time when the notion Rabenmutter um, was was basically created. In um, Eastern Germany, this concept, this notion of being a bad mother just because you give your child into child care for the time you work, that doesn't exist, and um, that's why um, um, women in Eastern or in former GDR. Um, parts of Germany have higher pensions in comparison to Western um, parts. And I think that is something we could definitely learn from. So there are differences, but there are also differences 
where um, the eastern parts of Germany um, have higher stakes in a positive way in comparison to western parts. Thank you for that. And there are a number of things that I, I would love to respond to, but I want to try to fold in a, a viewer question that I think um, ties in with your last point about the, the role of women in Eastern Germany and in Western Germany. And one of our viewers writes, aside from Merkel, leadership in the SPD, the FDP, and the CDU, CSU is dominated by older white guys. What are the hurdles in Germany for promoting women in politics? And I would say it probably doesn't just apply to politics, but also um, to business. Do either of you want to respond to that? Yeah, of course. Um, may I start? Um, it's an interesting point. And we see that um, women in politics are still less uh, represented. And I mean, this is not an East-West uh, question, I think. And I think also in, um, in the Eastern part of Germany, for, uh, in the politics, it's diff diff uh, difficult to engage women at this time, maybe much more than in the 90s, for example, because there, there were a lot of um, young women or women um, who are engaged in politics. I think of great politicians like uh, Regina Hildebrand, for example, and also our ac uh, actual uh, finance um, minister. Uh, she is um, also a, a woman uh, in Thuringia. And then we see in uh, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern in the north, we see in the Bundesland uh, a, a female um, a minister president. So we see it's it's possible, but mainly in uh, like, like um, um, certain positions. Um, and, and we see also in the western part of Germany, like in North, no, no, um, what's it called? Um, Okay, we have Malu Dreyer, for example, for the SPD in the Western part of Germany as a minister president as well. So it's not so much the divide between um, East and West, but what we see is that in companies, for example, in, in the middle mid um, level of management, for example, there are in the um, Eastern part of Germany more women than in the West in the comparison, but still in the in the main positions, in the highest positions, there are less women in both sides of Germany, I would say. So um, there's still uh, a gap we have to fill. And I think we um, should try to. And we, in business, we talk about uh, quotas and how we, maybe it's an uh, instrument to get more women in higher positions. It's highly dis um, discussed. And in politics, we talk about like um, uh, parity, or I don't know the, the, the parity, parity, mm -hmm. parity. Okay, thank you. Uh, we talk about parity. Uh, the SPD, for example, has like a party list when it's coming to vote for a um, mandate. Then we have like these parity in our party lists. So always women, men, women, men, or men, women. How you want to do it and. So that women get a higher chance to get a position or get vote, or get um, elected uh, for local parliament or for the parliament in the Bundesland or at the federal level. So there are um, we're trying to improve, but it's still difficult. And um, I want to add one point to what um, he just uh, said. Uh, about women who uh, worked in the GDR and are used to work and have children. I think this is a really important point, but what we still see also in the GDR is the role model of a woman and a mother. Hmm. They were working, but there are still all the household things to do hmm. and male, um, the, the, the husbands don't care about it in the main, uh, most of the time. So there's still this, um, um, a classical female role model who uh, has to care for the children and do the household and have to work. So women were really, really busy uh, also in the GDR to get all the things done they had to or they were expected to do. So they, the GDR government brought in like the household day and something like that to make it more easier. But this impression of role models was still the same like in the West. Maybe not that 
much or not that um, so so strongly, but still there. And what I see now is that also in the eastern part of Germany, uh, it comes more that um, young women were uh, who or young women who are at work, for for example, as a teacher, when they go quite. Um, early back to work it's still like it's all also the same that people are saying oh you're going back to work it's not too early because um, your child is so young even we have this really good structure of um, child care it becomes more and more um, uh, uh, obvious that also this uh, discussion we have now in um, eastern part of Germany so something is going to become like um, e a little bit equal, but I don't know if it's good or not. We can discuss that, but I see that um, that's also a form of a form of um, being one country and share the same discussions in each part of the country. I think that Gideon, very Gideon, last part um, was yeah. Sorry, um, I think that very last part that you said, uh, Elizabeth, is interesting. I think we maybe um, came from different sides, um, not regarding the the, um, the female role model, but rather or the model of, of a mother, but rather we face um, similar questions now as the our generation is asking for the for similar things but coming from different directions um, in, in society just 30, 40 years ago. Um, and my mom tends to say the same thing to me. Um, I have a little daughter and she always says, well, um, don't you think it's too early to go back to, to your job and give uh, your child, child into childcare so early? I think that is what you need to do if you wanna do both things and um, mm -hmm maybe that would have not come um, and I just I don't know whether that's true or not but I think that would have not come from your mother um, because she maybe has a different angle on, on looking at things not so much at, uh, uh, at things like um, you also have to do the housework um, when you come home but rather giving um, giving your child into very capable hands of the care system we have um, and I think that is a, um, an effort we need to take all together. And the question on um, why don't we have so many women in politics, but also in special positions in the Bundestag, I think that is a question that uh, we need to focus on more in the upcoming years because, um, and my party, um, uh, well, we are not the most... Um, female parties or we are not the most female party in the Bundestag so um, I see a lot of potential there but uh, these questions um, <laughs> no kidding yeah <laughs> I know that's um, that's a problem I'm, I'm currently working on but um, I think these questions uh, need to be raised together and they also need to be conquered together and that's what we're trying to do I think. So before we pivot and, and talk a little bit about the future, um, I'd, I'd like our viewer question that focuses on, on under-representation. We've talked about women. Um, obviously, we've talked about some of the discrepancies between East and West. And one of our viewers writes, two weeks ago, the left party posted an Antrag, basically a formal request, asking how many East Germans serve in leadership positions in government and the answer is quite remarkable. There are very few East Germans in leadership positions in parliament or in the chancellery. And the question is, what's going on? Why is there such a difference after 30 years? And isn't this an indictment of the unification process? Um, do you want me to start? Maybe you can add. Um, I don't, I wouldn't call it indictment, um, but I think that as um, as a goal of many, having more women in in, spe in in special positions in the Bundestag, having more people from the eastern part of Germany, but also having um, uh, people from or that migrated here with uh, with a background of uh, 
of different countries where their families came to all these questions need to be put in one ball together. I think it's not, it's not the right thing to only discuss uh, Eastern representation in positions or gender representation, but having the goal that the German Bundestag and also the chancellery and the ministries are made of um, a certain, well, a, a certain, now I'm looking for a word. Um, um, like a background of different genders. Um, Diversity. Diverse, yeah. We Diversity. need a more diverse representation um, in the Bundestag and also the ministries. And um, I wouldn't call it indictment, but rather uh, a long way to go. But it also depends on um, on the way the pers uh, the personnel and the staff is uh, is equipped and occupied, um, and how people in um, in higher positions are aiming for new staff. And I think. That is not so much only a question for us as parliamentarians, but also on the administrative level, a question of um, how uh, headhunting works, basically. Um, Elisa, I would Claire, agree. do you have any? Yeah, uh, I would agree to a certain point uh, to Gida. I think it's very important to get more diverse in every part of government or in parliaments or in also in, in business and management, because then you really address um, the interests of our very plural um, uh, people, our um, yeah, uh, society. But I think it's, I kind of understand the wish of Eastern Germans that they want more represented in, to want to be more represented in like in governments, um, for example, in Eastern Governments, also of Eastern Bundes Bundesländer, um, there are a lot of um, people coming from the western part of Germany, mm -hmm. and um, the people, uh, for example, in my constituency, they have the feeling they can't really um, get the problems or the the, um, the perspectives of the people they govern. So they feel, I think, they would trust the institutions more if they see people. They had the ba same background, the, uh, similar biographies or experiences in the past, or even the parents who had this experience, because also with the following generations, do something with the people. When your parents talk about how they experienced uh, the GDR and then the unification process. And I think this is why it's important for people to be represented. And it's not just like in government, it's also at the universities. and you have always some stereotypes or in ideas. And I think there, there are differences when you grow up in a certain part of Germany, you share some experiences and can better understand the needs or the interests of the people living there. I think this is a point uh, I would give to the debate of uh, which um, the Linke made up. And uh, But um, we see also, for example, uh, when I just grab a town, Erfurt is the main capital of Thuringia. It's a really nice town, old houses, rebuilt, look very nice, uh, like from the Middle Ages, and so nice to be there. But all the nice houses, uh, they are um, owned by people out of the western part of Germany. A lot of, similar to Leipzig and other parts of G um, Eastern Germany and cities. Mm -hmm. And um, even so, the population lives in the cities, can't afford um, anymore the, the rents to, to live there for the flats or uh, the houses. So they feel that like <laughs> the, the rest ball up um, their their state or their, their cities. So um, this makes also something with the people when they don't feel like they have their own future in their hands because it's not anymore theirs. And uh, this is just an example for people get the feeling they the best... Um, come up over them, like the whole political system, the society, the economic system. And it's such an, it's just an example of how they, you see it in, in real life. And that's why I think it's important for some people to, to see 
more Eastern people, uh, Eastern German people in some um, positions to present the, the needs or the interests of them. Although we have some, some great questions from our viewers, we're, we're coming close to the end and it would be a huge mistake not to ask you both to think a little bit about the future. Um, you're both well into your careers, but you have many years ahead of you. And I was struck last week when I read a piece by British historian Timothy Garton Ash in The Guardian, in which he argued that the last three decades have been the best in Germany's long and complicated history, but that the national and regional challenges that Germany has faced over the last 30 years pale in comparison with the global challenges it will face in the next 30 years. And so I wanted to ask both of you, as you think about issues like migration, like Brexit, like author authoritarian regimes in a Europe that has grown as you've grown up, what needs to be done to set the trajectory for Germany in the next 30 years? Good question. Yeah, uh, Elizabeth, you, do you want me to start or um, if you, you want, want to, to please right. go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. um, we are currently um, in the midst of the German presidency in the EU. And um, that's why I think the, um, the whole view of us parliamentarians is very much focused on um, how should Germany use these um, these resting three months to um, engage in the setup, the structure, um, the way the European Union works. And I think uh, we should rather spend, as Mr. Gartnash also said, um, dealing and focusing on how will the world be in 30 years and not only in th three months. However, um, I think there are certain things that Germans or also the German presidency in the European Union, um, the seat in the um, Security Council at the United Nations, all these things um, should be used from a German perspective because um, when it comes to um, the campaign of uh, in the United States, for example, and the clash between systems between um, People's Republic of China and the United States, Germany within Europe, um, I think, could be bolder when it comes to the upcoming months and also years, because um, I think, or just a personal note, I think we would also be able to survive four more years of a president that, or who doesn't know how to run a country on the international level, um, let alone on the national level. But I think Chancellor Merkel uh, did a very good job on important and very difficult questions in, um, uh, in the last years. But she also needs to provide for her successor, whoever that might be, um, in the future. And I think a very practical thing that needs to change and that Germany could change on the European level would be to implement a qualified voting mechanism when it comes to international decisions um, of the European Union, because we're talking a lot about um, which countries or which individual individuals should be sanctioned uh, for very bad behavior, for human rights violations, for um, gross cases of corruption. And I think Germany could step up there and be one of the leaders when it comes in the European Union, when it comes to changing the system from within. Um, unfortunately, we will not um, have Great Britain in the EU. Um, I think that is a very sad example, but we should be able, or we need to be able to prevent that the European Union um, cracks down further so that other member states maybe also want to leave because they are not behind the whole idea of being stronger together. And the more we talk about uh, Germany within the European Union, the more sense it makes when it comes to these big questions such as migration or 
climate change. These questions will not be solved by national states um, and Germany alone or the United States, but rather by, um, by an alliance of democracies, let's call it that, because I'd like to include Canada and New Zealand and Australia on these countries. So um, I'd like to see Germany step up on these levels. Um, and also I'd like Chancellor Merkel to prepare for what is coming after her presidency, after her cha uh, uh, chancellorship, because um, sometimes I think she, um, she could do a better job in preparing for whoever comes next, um, because politicians tend to only think into, in, in, in legislative terms of four years, maybe five years. Um, I think we should rather think in generations. Yeah, um, I just want to add up Elisa. at some point. Yeah, thank you. Um, because I think you make it very clear, Gide, that the territory of Germany is uh, strongly combined with the, one of the of the European Union. And uh, European, European Union that uh, is doing well or not in the next years, in the next 10, 20 years. And now we have a quite difficult situation at the moment because we don't have like this quality um, uh, voting measures uh, at, at the European level. So we are dependent on like the uh, states of uh, Hungary or Poland, which are quite um, difficult to deal with in a lot of uh, topics, especially of migration. And we are talking about, for example, a new uh, European uh, migration system for years now and it's still difficult to get one and um, even so we face all the uh, um, effects uh, at the moment of a not really working migration system so yeah this is a question of the future of course um, and I think the next year will be could be a turning point in politics I don't know really in which direction because it's so unclear what's happened uh, what's happening after Angela Merkel because a whole generation not mine but following um, grew up with this chancellor in Germany and you just know Angela Merkel and I don't know and also other countries or she was always the the person they deal with and um, she was really reasonable and I think also, I must admit that, she did a great job in leading the country, especially on the international level. Um, but what's coming now? And I, I'm also not sure if you're prepared, if Germany is prepared um, this role to, nobody knows who will lead this country next year. It's not that um, secure anymore, like, or like uh, the last years, last um, terms, we knew always there was a great chance that Angela Merkel will uh, again be chancellor of this country and can, um, uh, following the polit the, her politics or her leading um, measure or the leading style. And um, now it's really unclear where we're going. I'm happy that um, my party or the um, Olaf Scholz, who is our candidate for a chancellorship, um, see that we have not just deal in terms that we don't ju just it's not um, um, sufficient to think about the next four years but to think about what are we doing um, in the 20s uh, for the next uh, 30 40 50 years to prepare for them uh, especially what's uh, in respect to economy what's what we have to do now uh, for example in the area of um, renewable energy um, systems, what you can do there to be like um, in advance of other countries, of other um, um, industries to be still a leading country about uh, in respect to economy. Um, all these questions and we are, of course, we are the party who looks at jobs, <laughs> um, which are, is a good uh, working style. Or is it, um, combined with a new economy. So also climate change. This is a big question of the younger gen generations because how will our planet be? How well will our planet be in the next 10, uh, 20, 30 years and longer? 
and now it's the time to to do something for it and we know that all countries know that but they still have their own interests and they're still looking for the short run uh, and their perspectives and their interests and so it's so hard to to find international solutions and there's again Europe so important and but I'm quite skeptical um, about the uh, functional Euro European Union because it's like a, you see the trends of nationalism especially during the corona time everyone shut, oh, the borders were shut down it's the first time I knew that borders were closed uh, in within Europe again so, um, so so many and this is a development I look like a little bit um, yeah concerned but also we see that democracies are doing better than like um, auto, uh, <laughs> um, like other countries with authoritarian systems yes um, and maybe this shows people that democracy is a good um, good um, system for their countries I don't know if they realize that so much but in their daily lives but we see this and I hope this is a chance to um, strengthen the democracy system, the democracies in, in Europe and all of the country and the populism ends somehow but this is a wish for me and I think we have to work for it it's not just coming from alone this has been such a rich conversation and there are so many things that I'd, I'd like to ask both of you as follow-up questions, um, but since we're running out of time, maybe just a, a, a very brief response from each of you on the following. Um, Elizabeth, you, you talked about the next year being a turning point in German politics, and both of you talked about a post-Merkel era where we don't know who will take her place as chancellor or even within her party who will take place. And given that there are a number of people on this call who watch German politics very closely, and there have been some questions in the chat function about what's going on in the periphery with the alternative for Germany, within the Linkspartei, within each of your parties, uh, the question I would have for you as we look at the next year is what should we as outsiders be watching in the German political landscape over the course of the next 10 to 12 months in the run up to the German election? Mm, I, I try to start. Um, I think what we see is that we have the alternative for Germany it's doing quite well, especially in the Eastern part of Germany. I think this is combined with um, lesser um, trust in institutions and the state in our still in our parts uh, of, um, of Germany. But uh, it's also difficult for the Linke, the left party, because they have like the same um, uh, voting ground or um, similar voting population. Um, they are more like disappointed of the government who feels uh, or distrust the, the government and they have a, like a similar nar narrative but we what we can also see at the moment is that during corona time government did quite well in germany in comparison especially to other countries so people uh, regain trust also in the eastern part of germany in the governing um, parties i'm a little bit sad that uh, main, <laughs> mainly the cdu is um Profiting from that, not so much the SPD. I we are all um, still asking why, <laughs> but this is a fact. But is for me the the good thing it is is that uh, people who maybe um, search for another solutions, more simpler answers, um, populist parties, especially alternative for Germany, comes now back to the like um, um, parties who they feel give them stability or give the country stability. So what would be interesting the next month would be, of course, um, the follower of Angela Merkel, who will be the candidate for the chancellorship. This is a very um, 
interesting uh, question. And um, then we will see um, the greens, how do they, uh, well they are doing, because um, we know that greens and the CDU um, going to have like a, a coalition. Um, I think both parties wish to have this. For the Greens, it's an opportunity to govern. And for the uh, CDU, is it a possibility to um, end like this big coalition thing, which is not good for any of us, for both parties at the moment, um, because it's um, the profile getting weaker at both parties uh, of the politics uh, to this coalition, like in the uh, perspective or the... Um, um, yeah, the perspective of the, of the people, they don't know really what they have of the CDU or of the SPD. Um, so, and also, I also think that the CDU um, lost voters in previous years because uh, and a lot of them go to the AFD because they, they thought they would be more like conservative and make more politics for their interests. It could be a reason. So I think Greens and... Uh, um, so it was interesting thing how they get together their interests and their party issues because they're quite um, far away from uh, from another, especially in climate um, questions. And for us, for the SPD, it would be interesting: uh, can we regain our strength or not? This is a, a huge question and a struggle we're still in. I I'm really honest here. Um, this is um, something we have to concentrate on our profile and. To do what we are doing for people who work um, and in which way we um, uh, create uh, new working places, how we um, uh, gestalten. I don't know, <laughs> I'm missing a word, it's an easy word, but gestalten uh, to and shape. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, shape, uh, thank you. Uh, shape. To shape. Um, the the, the uh, work of tomorrow and with more flexibility to combine um, work and family time or free time and such things. And this is what we have to do to get our profile back, to get a stronger profile that people know what I have with us. And this is a thing uh, which we're trying hard and to improve also our, our uh, rates in, the, in time of voting. Yeah. Well, the, um, the last word goes to you. Yeah, I think um, the uh, liberals and also the social democrats, we have um, similar challenges ahead of us. Um, and I think it's not so much about our programs. And I think for, for, uh, for the part of the uh, social democrats in the current government, I think it is rather a question of how you communicate certain successes, because I think you have a lot of them lying there. And for some reason, and I don't know what you could change to do that, but for some reason, uh, the, the Christian Democrats um, are, um, are getting the points, even though your ministers, such as Heiko, uh, Heiko Maas, or also um, Minister Heil, or also Olaf Scholz, they scored the, the goals. And for some reason, Chancellor Merkel and Jens Spahn, for example, get the credit for it. And, That's um, the million dollar us, question. <laughs> <laughs> and for us, it's basically the same question because I think we have some good positions and also we could work on, on, on certain questions very well together with the Social Democrats. And for some reason, we are not getting the communicative skills over to the voters as um, they also, or they only compare us or link us to being very market driven, very cold in a way, um, not very social thinking. And I think that is not true, but we need to work on our communication. So if anybody has some ideas, um, feel free to uh, send them to me or to us maybe. Um, and for um, Chancellor Merkel's successor, um, I would hope for, from an international perspective, that it will be um, uh, Norbert Röttgen. And I always cheer for the underdog, to, to, be, to be honest. Um, but I think 
Um, the race will be decided between Armin Laschet and Markus Söder because everybody I knows agree. that he will be running. He will be running. And I think he's just waiting for the right moment to announce. And so far, he has some challenges with his testing capacities of the COVID situation in Bavaria. So he, I think, needs to overcome that. And then he maybe announces. And the race between Armin Laschet and Markus Söder, I think it will be a very tight one. So I will not, I don't feel able to decide just yet. Um, so far, I would be leaning to, towards Armin Laschet because people are thinking of him as a more chantry person in comparison to Markus Söder. However, maybe um, people are or con very conservative voters would be on, on, on the ticket for Marco Suda. So um, that, that will be interesting. From a statesman perspective, I, I would like to see uh, Norbert Röttgen because I think he brings something to the international sphere that um, both under other candidates would not bring to the table. With regard to Olaf Scholz, um, well, he's, he's very Hanseatic, very, very, um, pragmatic <laughs> very pragmatic and very calm um, that sometimes is an asset and I think sometimes that is the challenge because he also needs to um, win voters from the southern parts of, parts of Germany here in the north and by emotion <laughs> exactly and I think um, in the northern part that um, will b work very fine but in the southern part uh, he needs to he needs to work on his um, surprises, let's say that. So, um, and I think with regard to the AFD, we've been seeing in the last two weeks how the narrative of um, the AFD has changed and or how um, drastically it has, been, um, it has been working out in the media. Um, maybe you saw these reports that came out of um, an investigative journalism team that had um, hidden cameras and um, asked some questions um, to uh, the former spokesperson of the AFD caucus in the Bundestag. And he said, um, the AFD will profit from a Germany that is going down. And when circumstances are worsening, that is the time when the AFD is, um, is earning some voters opinion. And I, I think that is just the most horrific way of um, trying to do politics, because we are working for the people um, and not against people. And I think the AfD will see that this notion or this narrative will not be working next year, because people will have um, many questions when it comes to Uh, their jobs, um, the, their way of life, but also the future in Europe and the world. And they do not have any answers towards that. They are just waiting for the next, for the next, um, um, I don't know, migrant crisis that might be hitting. And I think um, they are underestimating all other parties except the left because they are not used to being in government and in, in positions where things need to get done. Um, but other, all the other um, four parties, I think, should be working together to keep these, um, these outsiders left and right very, very small. Um, and then a coalition will be built, I don't know, maybe with, with us both here, um, with our parties or without, I don't know. But I think the AFD um, will not have any anything of a success next year. Well, Gita and Elizabeth, I want to thank both of you for this incredibly rich and wide-ranging conversation. There are a lot of issues that we've talked about, uh, some that we did not even get to. Next will be very interesting for German politics, much as the next interesting for U.S. politics. But throughout the next year, we really look forward to staying in touch with both of you and, and continuing the conversation. On behalf of the American Council on Germany, the German Consulate General in New York, and 1014, I want you 
for making the time to participate in this virtual transatlantic town hall. This has been a fabulous discussion and my deep thanks go out to both of you. Thank you very much. It was a Thank pleasure. Thank you.